Anasaru immediately said, we want to be in, we want to be part. Thank you to you too. Um, and again to the family and everyone who's attending here, thank you for being here. Just the, the order of what we'll do now, um, I'm going to give over to Brickers just to show us a video and slide so. Um, and then I'll hand over to Mr. Mark Alexander who will do an opening and welcome here, please. Sorry everyone, as you will have it, we tested beforehand and now it does, now the speaker doesn't work. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have another speaker and he is a man connected to rugby for a long, long time. He is a man who is connected also to the South African Council of Sport, the ISACOS. And more importantly, the drive and energy of this person has impressed so many people. And I want to say that it is indeed an honor to have him here this evening. I introduce to you Mr. Ibrahim Patel of the South African Rugby Union. Sponsorship in fact, it's not Mr. Krish Makadus, President of the Cricket Board, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. I received the invitation from the Transvaal Cricket Board to address you this evening. I to that invitation in the spirit of gratitude, of privilege, and utter humility. I understand that the Transvaal Cricket Board did not choose a topic for me to address you on. That would have made my task easier. But in the absence of giving me a topic, I have to draw certain assumptions. I assume that the Transvaal Cricket Board and perhaps all the sportsmen in this country would want to share with cricketers are uh, basically a general controversy. <laughs> the controversy that we've been engaged with has fundamental to it and to the core apartheid in this country and I will make no bones about that whatsoever. The proposed talk to South Africa by New Zealand has been topical, it has been heated, it has been debated vigorously and there are many issues that have, uh, has arisen. There is a school of thought that holds that politics and sport are indeed inseparable and that the New Zealanders have an absolute right to decide against whom they want to play, where they want to play, and when they want to play. I would underwrite that view as being absolutely correct. I would underwrite that view if that decision is taken in a democratic country that is given to freedom and that understands democracy. I believe that to be fundamentally correct. It is the prerogative of Spovelet in South Africa, then it is not rugby per se. Then indeed it becomes supportive of an ideology that governs my life and governs your life. 
And the New Zealanders must know in no uncertain terms that we have told them from the South African rugby point of view. We are prepared to play sport. We are sportsmen. But we are also victims of one of the most evil or one of the most hideous ideologies ever devised by the mind of certain thinking men apart it. Nothing on God's earth can ever deter us from seeking freedom and seeking justice. Those are not norms that, are, that belong to the South African Rugby Union. They are eternal norms and they are eternally true. Our sport has many dimensions. Some caters for people that play rugby at this moment in time. that video before actually the meeting, uh, what I read about Mr. Patel because it's exactly that um, <laughs> bold person, uh, not afraid to speak his mind. Um, I'm going to give over to Mr. Mark Alexander, the person who, knows, who needs no introduction actually. Uh, we met each other for the first time in France just before the final and then he blamed me for Vegas losing in Sultana. <laughs> Southampton never played against Rangers but it will be this year, I can guarantee you that. Um, Mr. Alexander, so uh, you, you are welcome to come, come forward. Thank you. I apologize. I've uh, got my back in front, so I have to sit. Uh, the minute I stand, my legs get lame. But it's a hard act to follow after you hear Mr. Patel speak. You know, the man was a true orator. But good evening, everyone. Especially to, good evening to, to the Patel family. Ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, I would like to express my profound gratitude to the event organizers for the honor of participating in this esteemed event. We gather here today to celebrate a trailblazer in non-racial rugby in our country. A figure who has always, you know, who has also been my mentor I have the recall when Mr. Patel recognized potential beyond my aspirations at the time, appointing me as the Deputy pre President of the Transvaal Independent Rugby Football Union while I was still a player. And back then, all, of, all my focus was just on playing rugby. I didn't want to get involved in administration. I didn't care about administration because when you're a player, that's all you think about. However, Mr. Patel, with his foresight, emphasized the importance of preparing for the future. He made me see that ensuring that continuity in leadership is rather important, especially with the aging cadre of administrators. It was critical for me to take up the role. But I said, no, Mr. Patel, you know, I, I, I want to play. I'm, I'm still a provincial player, so he said, no, no, you can play, but you'll, you, you'll become an administrator. Today I stand immensely thankful <coughs> for his wisdom and guidance that he bestowed upon me. Today we pay tribute to Mr. Patel, a schoolmaster and a visionary who dedicated nearly four decades for championing non-racialism and unity in rugby. His commitment was instrumental in bridging over a century of division of rugby in South Africa. The historic achievements of the unity in South Africa in the rugby unity I'm talking about. The 20th of March 1992 was the culmination of covert negotiations that began early in 1988. Mr. Patel used to meet with people and him and, and, and Paul Jardine and they used to lend out different cars so they don't be seen in the same car to do their negotiation. But you know, I've learned a lot about from Mr. Patel. We used to have our meetings every Sunday morning and uh, their mother used to make us the co-sisters, and we only leave when the co-sisters are finished. But you know, that's, that was Mr. Patel. 
These talks also involve various rugby authorities and the then African Pan-African National Congress. Key organizations that included now Unity was the South African Rugby Board, the South African Rugby Union, the South African Rugby Federation, and the South African Rugby Association, SARA, the body called SARFU. This momental unity was led under the joint presidency of Mr. Patel, representing SARU, and Mr. Danny Craven, representing the South African Rugby Board. <coughs> he also played a big role in keeping the players informed about the progress in unity. His guidance helped maintain patience and resolved amongst the, player, the players who endured <coughs> decades of sacrifice in pursuit of playing on 11 playing fields in rugby. His contribution to rugby in South Africa stands shoulder to shoulder with those of the greatest administrators in the history of our sport. His efforts in unifying the rugby community after years of deep-rooted division was nothing short about being remarkable. In reflecting on Mr. Patel's contribution to rugby, we see a legacy marked by service at multiple levels, as the secretary, as the spokesman, and ultimately the president. It was a testament of his leadership and dedication that he, along with the late Danny Craven, became the inaugural executive president of South African rugby. Mr. Patel, commitment to rugby extended way beyond the borders of our country. His diplomatic engagements took him to London, Harare, Lusaka, where he met with representatives from the former rugby board and the ex-style leadership of the ANC. That was despite their status of being a banned organization at the time. His tireless efforts were pivotal in the unity of our sport securing his place not only at the cornerstone of rugby in South Africa, but also on the global stage when he worked with the International Rugby Board, now known as World Rugby. Beyond his administrative ac acumen, Mr. Patel was a gifted orator, and you could hear it earlier. He was fluent in English and Afrikaans in his speeches, and he never spoke only English, he spoke both at the time. He had the unique ability to draw from diverse cultures, references. Quoting eloquently from the Quran and the Bible in his speeches, I'm deeply indebted to Mr. Patel for introducing me to the, the realms of sports administration. I was still a player for Transvaal when, the, when he made me deputy. And it was Mr. Patel who believed firmly in succession planning at the time when that word wasn't banished around the, 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 the corporates. He spoke about then, about succession planning. So he was a visionary. My own part, Nazli, Asharaf, and Fahad, their willingness to share Mr. Patel with the rugby community, often at their own personal cost, played a critical role in the success and advancement we celebrate today. Their contribution, often unseen, but always significant, has been instrumental in shaping the landscape of our rugby in our country. And for that, I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander, and thank you for availing yourself. I know you were one of the first uh, people that immediately said you want to be here. Um, Thank you for those, those, those kind remarks. We're going to have a, a quick short slide, sir.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we, we're going to give over to Dr. Hendrik Snyders now. I think some of us came especially for this moment um, to address us. Um, and then just thereafter, I'm going to give over to Iran Kunderwald that's going to um, conduct the panel discussion. <coughs> Thank you, Chairperson. Um, you will see I, I also carry a piece of paper because I take my example from the president of SA Rugby. <laughs> you see, all people of importance seemingly need to have some paper. Trigas, uh, can I ask you to keep the image of Mr. Patel in front of Because I think it's important uh, and I want to first and foremost express my gratitude to the organizers of this event to be assigned the honor to speak about one of our greatest administrators in non-racial rugby in the hundred plus years that black people played this game. The Tosa word for the game is bot. The thing that is not harm. Now, now, ladies and gentlemen, as we meet here today, there are eight biographies of black players and administrators written. We have been playing this game for a hundred plus years. In this time, we only have eight biographies of black players, administrators, and officials. In case you don't know, there's a biography of Chester Williams, there's a biography of Beast, there's a biography of Peter de Villiers, there's a biography of Dengtete, there's a biography of Tando Manana in this hall tonight, there is a biography of Kasim Jabbar in this hall tonight, there's a biography of Bill Jardim that the president of Saru referred to. And there's a biography of Ashwin Wilmser. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have been playing this game for more. Rugby was the first sport to establish a South African identity on the international front. And even more sad. The South African Colored Board, established in 1896, are older than Rugby Australia, the French Rugby Federation, and so I can go on. In fact, the organization that Mark Alexander, Gary Bosov, Kasim Jabbar, Peter Uester, Neville Heilbron, and all of us comes from, are older than some of the most important rugby nations in the world as we speak. Yet, when you look at South Africa's national orders, you know, every year the president of this country will hand out the order of Awai Tambu, the order of the Boabab, in the order of Ikamanga. Those are the national orders where the president of our country will celebrate achievement in this country by rewarding worthy citizens. And let me tell you, or let me give you a frightening statistic. The order of Ikamanga which is supposed to be given 
to excellent achievement in rugby or in sport in general. No rugby administrator, black or white, has been given the order of Ikamanga. In comparison, football or soccer has taken the bulk of these achievements. In fact, I want to take you one step further. In the FNB Stadium in Soweto, or on the outskirts of Soweto, and formerly at Sun City, there is the South African Hall of Fame, where private enterprise inducted people every year that made a contribution to South African life and culture. The last induction was the 1995 World Cup winning team. The only other Springboks or the only other rugby personalities inducted in the South African Hall of Fame is the gentleman with his dog that stands outside of this building, Dr. Danny Craven. The only administrator inducted in the South African Hall of Fame. Let me take it one step further. Currently under the auspices of World Rugby, four Africans inducted. The last South African was inducted last year, and that was Brian Habana. But the funny thing, when you look at the 30 names inducted in the International Rugby Hall of Fame, the division is as follows. Six of those inductees are rugby players. Two of them are rugby coaches. One of them is a politician. And the last one is a rugby administrator. The gentleman with the dog outside of this building, Dr. Danny Kramer. Now, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, as much as this deserve their induction, their recognition, there are a couple of fundamental questions that we need to ask when we reflect on the life and times of Ibrahim Suleiman Patel. And these are the fundamental questions that comes to mind. How is it that a community that played this game for more than a hundred years consistently failed to recognize its own? What then is the fundamental problem? Now the one problem is the lack of official archive. You know, we all know where we come from with apartheid when information was dangerous and we hide things in the roof, we hide things in every very funny place. The problem is, as long as those archives remain hidden, we cannot tell the world about the exploits of Kabamba Fluors, of Gary Bosov, of Peter Uester, Kasim Jaba, you just name it. So the problem of official archives and the fact that we sometimes burn the records because we cannot account for the money, you know, this is a thing. It causes that there is this gap in our rugby identity because reconstructing the past is difficult. But there's another problem, the problem of gatekeeping. You know, colleagues, 
It's fine if somebody don't want to share his or her information with you or with whoever is interested in recording our history. The problem with gatekeeping is you keep the gate so tight and you make the gate so high that nobody can enter the gate, meaning you deliberately cause a situation where we cannot tell the world about the worthy contribution of administrators and players in that the likes of Ibrahim Patel fought for. So keep your gate. You write yourself right out of history. You write your generation right out of history. But that's not the only problem. We have a publishing industry that will tell you to your face that a book on Kabamba floors alone will sell but not a book on Azraf Patel. Because he was a springbok and you were merely a provincial player. And if you can add scandal and sensation to the story because Kabamba eloped with a other person or player's wife, it sells the book. It is the book that the publishers so gladly will, 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 will publish. But when somebody approaches them and wants to write a story about the life and times of Toby Titus, Ibrahim Patel, and let me make a quick turn. If I give you the name of a gentleman called Bali Sali, I'm sure that 99.9% .9 of you in this room won't know Bali Sali, or Clive Sharp, or Sinkan Maui, or Gerald Mans, or Edmund Eagles, Mr. Mark Alexander will know them, because they were his predecessors and the predecessors of Ibrahim Patel. They were the shaping influences in the life of Ibrahim Patel as an administrator. So what I want to do, colleagues, is to demonstrate to you that it's nice to keep your photos in your bar at home. It makes your bar look so lovely. And it makes your whiskey drink so liquor. The problem is you are doing the nation a disservice. We are also confronted with the disinterested commercial media. You see the hype of Varsity Cup is more preferable to the struggle of soft call or Bosan Park because the name of the venue doesn't even sound sexy. <laughs> and this is how we deny ourselves. Now why am I telling you this, friends? All the names that I've been throwing around is applicable to Ibrahim Patel. Ibrahim Patel becomes the lens of those who went before. He becomes the successor to Robert Grendon, the first president of the South African Colored Rugby Football Board, the first body for black rugby players established in this country in the 19th century. Ibrahim Patel becomes the representative of James Mawela Dipa, the first president of the South African Bantu Rugby Football Board, established in 1935. Ibrahim Patel 
even becomes the representative of Gilbert Lauriston of the South African Rugby Federation established in 1959 out of the same sorrow that Patel Lee or led until unification in 1992. In fact, Ibrahim Patel becomes the golden thread that link our rugby in the 19th century to the sorrow that Mark Alexander is leading today. Because under his leadership, Josiah Bailey, Toby Titus, Jackie Abrams, um Harold Wilson, Fred Hofke, and all of those, they were the custodians of the dreams of the people that started Black Rugby in the 19th century. Patel is the custodian of 100 years of history. So we dare not forget. We dare not forget that Neville Heilbronn, as a referee of Saru, became the first black referee after unification that acted in a Curry Cup game and an international game to show us the way of non-racial officials. But do we recognize Neville Heilbronn? and all the other officials that worked under Ibrahim Suleiman Patel, who became, yet again, the custodian of 100 years of consistent struggle for non-racial rugby. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Ibrahim Patel was a product of his times. And he was specifically a product of Transvaal rugby, a very important province. By 1951, the Transvaal Colored Rugby Board was in serious trouble. In fact, the union almost died. And then four clubs had the wisdom to convene to establish the Transvaal Independent Rugby Football Union, 1951, led by Eric Aronson, Edmund Eagles, Sydney Hope, and Arrange. And between 1951 and 1960, Fiel emerged onto the provincial stage. Rugby in Transvaal was a dynamic business. But who oh, that was gevaarlijk om daar te speel? The Newtonians and Americans and Californians and Good Dobes and Caledonian Roses and all of those you had to have hair on your teeth to survive. In fact, in 1965, when Ibrahim Bali, the Transvaal rugby was in serious problems. It is reported that in the final involving Caledonian Roses, Ibrahim's club, there was a full-out field invasion in a brawl that left Mr. Isibali in hospital because the love of the trophy overrides the love of the game. And this had a fundamental influence on the life and administrative style of Ibrahim Patel. And Gary Bosel will tell you when Pete. Yusuf will endorse that. 
that when you appeared in front of a disciplinary committee led by the gentleman under the leadership of Ibrahim couldn't finish the final, nobody will see the trophy. The trophy, the SA Cup, was shelved because the president and his leadership wasn't willing to entertain a situation that anybody will disrespect the rules of the game and the spirit of the game. And the violence experienced in turf competitions right through the 1960s influenced Patel's approach to administration. So by the time that he became Turfu secretary, <coughs> when the firm the clubs weren't happy, they started to know. And when you read through the Randy Mail of the Times, they accuse Clive Sharp and Ibrahim Patel of being dictatorial to the extent then by 1971, the two gentlemen decided that we will not stand for re-election. Let those who want to dictate the pace in Transvaal rugby, let them take the lead. And you know what was said when you read through the records of the time? When some of the players went to the founding members of Turfu and say, gentlemen, please enter and assist us to clean up this union of ours. Some of them said, all right, no thank you. It's your mess. Despite that snub, Ibrahim Patel remained loyal to the ethos and the spirit of rugby. A game where you, where you are expected, first and foremost, to respect the rules. Secondly, to respect the match officials. Thirdly, to respect your fellow players. And fourthly, to respect your fan base. And Ibrahim Patel never compromise on that principle. So by the time that he became the secretary of SARU on the national level, he was known as a disciplinarian. He was known as a guardian of the spirit of the game of rugby football. And he has learned the important lesson. There is no glory in popularity. Because your fans today are the wielders of the knives in your back. So it's easy today for people with the wisdom of looking back and hindsight to say, didn't Sus Bailey and Toby Titus and Ibrahim Patel sold us out? The danger of those um, lines of thinking, ladies and gentlemen, is very easy. Because you are free today to talk whatever nonsense you want. If you want to say something about somebody's house in Dubai, you may say so. If you want to say somebody about somebody's nose, you are free to say so. If you want to, and I need to say it maybe in Afrikaans. Asma means a part of the pai ki dra asma. You bet? The man of the losses. The man of the pai ki dra. Die mannen met die vernie kaartjies. Nou, dat is makkelijk. Niet zo easy. I remember in my days when I worked for, for, for social services, with, when grants were still with social services, die tannies al altijd daar kom en sê, meneer, 
Tai asraf patya Hai Muni agran kari I said now what is wrong with asraf patya He said no Ek kari no si agran ti Ma ti kari So the only rule for right or wrong Is I don't get As baiki draars Loosie loopers It's easy You don't have to fight for freedom Because as Riley, Tommy Titus, Jackie Abrams Noorki Khan, Leroy Latigan And so can I can't learn from They pay the price So that you can today freely say Die ou Me die bol en die hond Die beite Was een skolle Jy kan het vandag makkelijk sê. Because you didn't pay for freedom. The people that pay, they are normal. They are the Moseses of our time. They have seen the promised land. They were unfortunate to enter the promised land. And now that we are able to enter the promised land, we want to keep the open door and we want to take the doggy bag of our freedom because we are allowed but when I can't get to the table to fill up my doggy bag I suddenly remember that indeed Danny Jones is a bikey driver all the innuendo that goes with that If you are in the Boland, Dimitri, you know anything about 20-minute voice notes. <laughs> <laughs> There is a young man, he called himself Anwar Daniels. He goes around messing with the neighbor's wife, according to his own record. And he will go around and say, Mark Alexander, yay, and the bike Where do you intervene because of this and that? And so forth. But the bottom line is, they never paid for this freedom to be a springbok like Africa. To be a blitzbok and who goes unrecognized outside and for whom Ibrahim Patel was the last guardian of the desire and the ideal of full non-racial equality on the field of play representing <laughs> South Africa I want to take you into <coughs> my last thing to give you another perspective as well I want us quickly to look to the period 1972-1978 because it was a critical time in the history of this nation. In 1971, Patel became the Secretary of Saudi. But that was just after the White Springboks toured Great Britain where the anti-apartheid movement chased them all over the place. And the world began to isolate South Africa. And the operators in this country being the police, the Bureau of State Security, and all the other formations of the apartheid government decided to call the activities of all non-racial sports persons. They designated their actions, their boycotts, their protests as revolutionary activities. You were fostering, you say, as by revolution. You remember when Toby, when Fred Afki was arrested, 
Because you and him and Betty King, you were revolutionaries. You were fostering the flames of dissent. So the system established a number of front organizations. And in the sports field, they established the Committee for Fairness in Sport. It's the same government that gave my players a fair opportunity to play for South Africa. They call the Committee for Fairness in Sport. And they gave the founder of this organization is the Bureau of State Security, also known as BOSS. The way to fight a revolution is to start a counter-revolution. You know, so they declare war against the non-racial movement. In the strategy are the following. First, we must break the unity of Africans, Coloreds, and Indians. And the lack of touring opportunity as a tool to divide the non-racial sports movement. So we gave certain people an opportunity to tour overseas, while others who are hardline political nuts, they don't get an opportunity. Uh, and you know who, who didn't tour, eh? Pijuas uh, never tour. Kasim Zewa never tour. Although Danny Craven said, if you look for a good crowd that would represent South Africa flawlessly, you look at that passenger. I never told. Because you see, the problem was, Kasim was fostering revolution under the influence of the likes of Ibrahim Patel and all of these other gentlemen sitting here. So what did they do? They started a whisper campaign. That goes like this. Africans are the majority in this country. So they must be led by Africans alone. So, who led rugby? Nurki Khan, Abdullah Abbas, Ibrahim Patel. Some of them are half Indian. Some of them are colored. So, we need to get rid of them in terms of the counter-revolutionary strategy. And they start this whisper campaign. So now Indians are screwed up. They are a bunch of crooks. And they use a black person. The gentleman's name was, his surname was Sohomi. And with them, in the, in the Committee for Fairness in Sport, they use the voices like Gary Player, they use the voices like Louis Leight, they use the voices of a guy called Volley Volmerans, and these guys went together with the system apparatus and they tried to divide the sport fraternity that opposed apartheid in every way. While the Committee for Fairness in Sport so division, BOSS is the security branch arrested administrators that were out of line. Ladies and gentlemen, if it wasn't for the information scandal in 1978, these things would never have come out. So if you, the family of Patel, one, have wondered about why did somebody throw a brick through your window, you know why. If your father and you as a family were confronted by slander and innuendo that Islam says a clomskyalums, then you know where the source of this rumor came from. And so I can cite many examples, ladies and gentlemen. 
But the leadership around Ibrahim and with Ibrahim leading were resolute because they were loyal in their resistance. They were loyal to the ideals of human rights. They were loyal to the game of rugby and the spirit of rugby. And they were loyal to the notion that all people are born free and should have full human rights. And that is why they became loyal resistors. Because they want a non-racial nation, they resist. Because they were loyal to the notion that South Africa should be represented by all of its players. <clears throat> Ibrahim Patel and his leadership around him were loyal resistors who collectively became the custodian of the dreams formulated in 1897 when we established the first national rugby body. But Ibrahim was also not afraid of controversy and an independent opinion. And maybe Pete and, and, and um, Toby will remember this very well, and I would like to conclude with this. In 1982, we had the Sarkos Festival, the first national event of all national non-racial sports, where the idea was to demonstrate to the world the beauty of the talent that was in the non-racial fold. So there were two teams selected. The National Cycles for Fee and the Presidents for Fee. And the Cycles decision was that all national teams will play their games in black and gold. And the Sarkos or the Saru leadership led by Abbas and obviously the secretary Ibrahim Patel, they refused. They sent the national team on the field despite the instruction from Sarkos in green and gold. Why? Why? Why would you defy the national body? Why would you take an opposing position ideologically when it comes to that? It got everything to do with the fact that the Saru leadership, Ibrahim Patel included, they were the custodian of the dream started in 1939 with the first all tied that the national side will play in gold and green. Yes, Mark. They even call themselves the Cabot Springboks. Something that a lot of our generation didn't want to accept. That we called ourselves Springboks. And when you look at all the badges and emblems of Saru rugby since 1939, you will see the springbok happily jumping. So, Ibrahim Patel was a partner. In 1982, the same year, when there was a split in the ranks of the quasi Kele rugby union between Zwiru and Zwaru, and which relayed, and which in the end resulted in the establishment of a fourth rugby body, the South African Non-Racial Rugby Board, that Untobi, I'm sure, still remember. It was Patel that had to negotiate. Together with the other collective leadership, about the breach in the ranks of Quaro, which was at that point, the key opposition for the likes of Western Province and Tigerberg and so on. And Ibrahim was there. When there was issues about 
working with the NAC from an ideological perspective, Ibrahim Patel was there. When it came to negotiate with the system in Harare and everywhere, Ibrahim Patel was there. And so I can go on, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to conclude in my book, Ibrahim Patel is first and foremost a loyal resistor. Loyal to the cause of rugby. Loyal to the cause of humanity. Loyal to the cause of full equality. But also a fiercely independent thinker. To differ when it's needed. But he also know the pain of disappointment. He also know Surely in the last days, he could hear the whisper, gossip, of people that says, we were sold out. It's always important to remember, every generation fights with the resources at their disposal. And we should be very careful not to look at the past with today's spectacles mm -hmm. because it makes the world different. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Doc. Um, this is like a couple of years in the last decade, the last decade, you in the world. And for us, it's only the fact. Um, I was <laughs> to go to the voice note. But I know it comes in the order of in the I have a few of Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. Good um, evening. Welcome. Welcome, UBC and Los Angeles State. It's really an honor and a pleasure for us to, to partner uh, with this event. Um, interesting enough, Professor Kurundan Rikas. A couple of months ago, we spoke about how do we recontextualize the history of rugby. A few months later, we still don't have it because of its sensitivity. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why we didn't hesitate once to say we want to be part of the event. And, and the honor to, to facilitate the panel discussion. I'd like to call on Mr. Toby Titus, fondly known as Mr. T, my mentor, father figure, and one of the most decorated rugby administrators and leaders. Tante Manana and Rikus, both from the Eastern Cape. Yeah. <laughs> the Eastern Cape of queer rugby. <laughs> and play for the Springboks. Thank you for joining us from afar. And when we stood outside, uh, Tando um, fondly remembered coming here to Stellenbosch. 1996? 1996. Oh, I'm not too bad at the and, and he's published his book, so thank you for telling the story. And then Rikas is currently our head of rugby, played with Tando. They come a long way. Um, and it's a pleasure to, to, to work with you, Rikas. Um, Romano, former chair of SAFCO, still serving the game. Where is he? Oh, hi. <laughs> and he's been working so hard behind the scenes to make this happen, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Hendrik, you need to join us up front again. And Prof. Albert, uh, very respected academics. And they have published extensively on the history of rugby. And um, they continue to do amazing work. While they inform us about the history, they challenge us. You've just heard Hendrik challenging us. And I think the history needs to be shared more widely. So the unification process for rugby started more than 30 years ago. Mr. T, um, I'm going to kick off with you as one of the longest serving rugby administrators here tonight. Um, we've heard a lot about the late uh, uh, Mr. Patel. But if, could, if you could share with us maybe your top, top two memories that, that you have. Because Mr. T, this is a safe space. You can tell us now the things about the behind the scenes. <laughs> I had that one thing said. He's Andy Dexter. He's English and Afrikaans. So, uh, 
एक्शन आदि ताल में टंकी लांग इन एक प्लेयर नोह उत्सुकेंट ही जैसी और ताली से से फिर प्रधान से स्टूडेंट और डी कैंपस में पेंटेक वाटर सीबीयूटी इस पेटी पर उनसे कपूत एंड सीरे पर सीबीयूटी वन दिस इज से आउट ऑफ पेंटेक वाटर ऑन्स नाखला तो थी मैं ये ला इस हनी प्रधान नोह को ये तो हम तो बखन मैं ये ला एक लेयर स्कॉप लेयर eigenschappen getoond. En dit maak my alle bly dat ek vanaand iets kan sê. Die ongeluk is ons met die sportgeskiedenis en dan die verhinderk en context sien. Nothing shall out of the air. It required commitment sacrifice and also the possibility especially when you were students and what they call today the dean of students when i was the dean of students at cput we had long discussions about the political situation in the country and how sport fits in in order the slash back on a scale no normal sport in an abnormal society in ons het gevloe dat jelle daar was en jelle afstudeer het you will be the leaders wherever you are even if you go back to your birthplace and we've seen the fruits of your labor I'm very proud every day when I open sometimes the paper and I see the progress our ex students has made. I I want to name a student leader with you. It was that time on campus Penny Bailey. He's today the deputy president of SAPA. Mount the rest of all Die geschiedenis van Zuid-Afrika voor die eerste vrije verkiezing was bitter en was hartstikke. Ons als rugby mensen, starting with Mr. Patel, Mr. Alexander, Petty Keen, all those that were here, we were called communists because that was the easiest way to thank people that was opposed to the harsh policy of apartheid. Ek is nie skaam om te sê ek kom van a plaas nie, want daar het ek die liefde van die doodgewone mens geleer. Daar het ek gesien die liefde versport en onder wat a hachtelike omstandighede dit ook gewees het. Daar was een vjaar, as jy weet die pale is, dan kan jy nie sien die doelie van die kant af nie. Jy moet eerst tot op die midde en kom ek gaan jy weer af op die mens. Non-existent facility. Ek moet dit in context noem. Dit was hier alles. Kabamba het die eer gehad en baie anders om in die vrije Zuid-Afrika te speel en ook die groene goud te verwerp. Maar ons, die ouwe manne, het baie zwaar gekry. En ek so bly Terry Bostoffel en die man is hier. En omdat op die campus daar anti-stelsel gewees het die studenten, die massa van die studenten. Je nacht moet kere hulle uit hulle uit hulle kossese en by Pentec gevlug het soos die federate politie hulle gejaag het. Dit was nie een lekker tijd nie. Maar sport het ons gebid, en die spoor het ons oorbid. Ek het die voorgeheid om weer eensam met Mr. Mark Alexander en Petty Kien en die manne vergadings moet Nelson Mandela het, en ons van ons het gedien 
op die een iets commenteer. En een dag was die debat hier wel. En na die debat tussen de preek, toen kwam Dr. Kevin naar mij toe en ik slaat mij zo aan die. En ik zei, wel, ik zei toch niet, wat het die aan tegen mij? Ik zei, ik heb niks tegen jou niet. Maar mijn pa zei hier, ik moet niet met de toemond zitten, die verschillen. Zij het openlijk, zodat mensen weten waar je staat. Ik nooit meer daarna voor mij vragen van. Ik wil bij je dankie sê vir u wat vanavond is, wat bij Savo gestaan het, dier dik en dun. I, I, nie een van u kan sê dat u onder ideale omstandighede spook beoefen het nie. Ons loop nie met ons geloof op ons mou nie. Maar na 1994 was daar een behoefte om in die samenspreking te houden. Want wat is daar toen nog, want jij het die stemrecht opgehaald. Jij kon vir jouzelf besluiten en wat er is in die land te gaan. En een dag uh, toe sê van die Zuid-Afrikaanse rugbyraad, toe ons op geschiedenis verduidelik aan hulle, toe sê, toe ek ken een man, he said to me, we actually lived in two worlds in South Africa until now. Maar die uitdaging aan, aan ons ammer is, ons is bezig met nazibou, dier middel van sport. Ons moet samenstaan en dit wat die strijkelblokke is, moet ons uit die weg uit. Want niks keer ons mee nie. Ons moet dit doen ten koste van ons kinders en ons nageslag. Die laat my wil even op hoog bij, dankie. Sê so, Hendrik spoke passionately about, you know, how do we decide to tell our history? Because history is a, a, it's a story where we come from, uh, where we are, and possibly where we're going. It's, it's connected. And listening to Mr. T, you know, if you put the puzzle together, it, will, it, it should take us somewhere. However, um, Hendrik and, and Prof. Prindling, I want both of you to respond to this point. There's a lot of um, unhappiness, uncertainty. Um, people are sad, people are upset. Uh, either the history has been told appropriately or not told appropriately. Or maybe the archives are in the bar, we don't know. How do we change that? If history is about where we come and telling us where we're going, how do we change that first and foremost? And for who do we change that? I'll start with uh, Prof. Kuna. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, I really do appreciate being invited here. I've got no special credentials, really, except that uh, I grew up in Oatsong, and so did Kabamba Fluas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, we lived in two separate worlds, but I still got very fond memories when he started playing for Southwestern Districts, and I these feats on the rugby field, and I'm very glad that you've been appointed uh, as a coach at Marty's. Uh, to answer your question, I, I, I think that there must be much more of a general awareness of the intersections that you hinted at. And that struck me listening to, to outlining Patel's uh, a career. And I've been doing some work on Craven. I try to reinterpret Craven. And uh, as a kind of counterpoint now, I may mention that it struck me that despite the fact that they, Patel and Craven were often at loggerheads, and it struck me now one point that they did have in common, and that was loyalty to the gang, a higher ideal. Despite their, uh, their, their animosities and the real reasons which divided them, there was a a love of the game, and that sounds maybe sounds like a cliche, but that's actually the important part. 
Hendrik emphasized that kind of loyalty. And I think you must look at, for those at this stage in our history, you must look at things that intersect, not things that divide all the time. That's when we had to, if I just give me another second, please, you know, when we had to redesign or, or reconfigure how we're going to present Craven. Uh, and initially it was just that Craven must be the only person that occupies. Then we thought about it and thought, no, that, that doesn't represent South African rugby. This Janny Engelbrecht and the hippies that Twain are like me, so Craven was there. And that's the other story where Baron Craven is too belangrijk geworden, so that they probeer a place. But so what, so we decided now, we're going to have Ebron Patel there, and and I know, I know where I find myself, but uh, Edel Tobias should also be there, I, I felt, as a federation person. I, I think then, then, we got the, 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 then we got some kind of balance. And I think that's what we must, we must bat for. And that kind of notion has got to be spread uh, more evenly across society. And by, by just publishing this stuff, I think you mentioned that people don't read, and, uh, which is sad, but there are other ways of con conveying that uh, message and making it more complicated than still being in opposing camps after all these years. Thank you, Elon. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Ilam, for, for the question. Uh, this whole thing of, do we need archives to write our history? Uh, I would like to share quickly my experience. Recently, I was part of a four-man team who undertake to write a history of African rugby in particular. And we started off on the same basis. There is no official archive. Because the old Bantu board, and later the African board, and later the South African Rugby Association, all their records disappear in thin air. So initially, all of us were saying, no, but no. So we, so we did a very simple thing. We asked one person to trek through the Eastern Cape literally to go from house to house and look at the wall where all these old pictures of teams with balls if it was the older and the ball no gedate mok gaan en boot in die foto het daar gestaan die wimmers hoek kampioen of die geraadse dak so, out of that, we reconstructed a history of African rugby. So you don't need, records are not always written. Yeah. The story, I used to work at Saru as the heritage manager. <laughs> so I, so I, in the collection, there is this plaque of a match played in Joburg. And on this plaque, there's a list of names of who played in this Saru 15 game. And the first name that struck me was Irvin October. So Irvin was my colleague, so I went to him down the, the, the passage and I said, Irvin, tell me from the game, man. Ik zie zei die game is weer. Hij zei, dat is hier waar. I didn't play in this game. Hij zei, how can you say you didn't play in this game? Here you are. Hij zei, let me tell you, man. I got injured in the practice. Prior to the game. I never played. Ik zei, moet niet liggen, man. Die Cape Town zei, Irwin October scored the try. Assist in scoring a try and kick two conversions. Because I had access to Irvin and his version of events 
we were able to reconstruct that particular event. So oral history, the photo against the wall, the photos in the attic, honorary quay, any schooner box, all of that, ladies and gentlemen, holds the secret to our story. You don't always need official archives. Romano, uh, Mr. Alexander mentioned um, that back then, Mr. Patel, he was a visionary. He understood the importance of succession planning. So if you look at the landscape of South African rugby today, do you believe that enough has been done so that you can become a provincial leader or even take over from Mr. Mark Alexander? Any debater. Elan, thank you for the question. I beschouw myself as by you before, and I think a better word in Toby would be blessed. And allow me to say why. I get dearly before I had um dearly club strategy to come by Safco. Let on a voice voice and I, that journey took me to SRIP, where I was part of the administration for, for eight years and then later on a consultant. Last year I had a great opportunity to engage the day after the final, the chairman of World Rugby. And I said all of that to say the following. Ekas Alambo was that was staan op die skouwers van ander mense. I was able to live in that space because of the sacrifices of Mr. Ibrahim Patel, his family, um Toby, and so many others. En het is belangrijk vir my om a klein deel, a klein rol te speel om anno die story te vertel. I was only that way. I was at the launch of the Overberg Challenge, and the gentleman that came up to put forth the rules, Mr. John Isaacs, he played for City and Suburbans. He took five minutes, five minutes, and he unpacked to all the chairmen there, all the captains, all the coaches. It just took five minutes, five minutes. And he unpacked the history of the different unions. My question is, what would happen if at every game, every talk, we use it as an educational opportunity? In one of the engagements, country bled enough, isn't it time that we take hands and work together? And leading up to this event, I started realizing that you're navigating difficult waters. The reform that has come, the spectrum of reform, so many people, so many opinions. And I get myself beginning to say, is that question not enough for today relevant? Isn't it time that, isn't it that the Patel family? and so many others have bled enough. Isn't it time that we take hands and work together his and so many others' legacy? Was it a part of success? It's a very moeilijke vraag van Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander was my my boss. Gelukkig as ek nou hier ek is nou op die vriende so, misschien kan ek een side step, maar uit die 2013 dit is baie goeie jaar gehad by die club, en ons die rekord gestel, en gaan het weer sê, is as een volg van die sacrifices, want ek en Dimitri, wat vandag in die spaties is, ons het die sekretekspolisie wat er die nacht aan ons dieren kom, kom kloppie en was er in my diep geraak om te hoor met my gesprekke met die familie, gespoegd in die gezicht. It's deep, 
En het had hoe ik het om die wilde succes bij de club, maar daar was je onvoorzichtig. Zo so ik moest op beide gaan kijken in die in die bezigheidswereld. Er is iemand wat te bijdragen maar in die programdirecteur Dimitri Jacobs uh, het een kanaal een pad van hom gestap. En samenwerking is belangrijk. En ons moet bij die punt kom waar ons ons verschille in kan sit. If we can't agree on who should the panel be, let's agree on that Mr. P Mr. Patel deserves to be on it and we move in that line. I thank you. Thank you. Because um, you and I chatted before this and we spoke a bit about different experiences. So you've experienced the game of rugby differently. But yet you understand the importance of diversity, um, the importance of inclusion. You work, you continue to work hard to achieve that. So as a as a player and now uh, one of the younger administrators, tell us a little bit about you know your experience and what do you think? How do we take this history of rugby and make it part of today as relevance as as a young administrator? You know, how do you feel about that? You, you perhaps, you know, when you grew up, you might not have, you, you read about Mr. Patel because you're in rugby, because I know you read widely. You, you didn't, you know, necessarily experience, sometimes we talk about the days at CPUT, Pentec, Mr. T, and, and we share our worlds. Our, our worlds were different. When I started here at Stellenbosch University, people asked me, what race are you? So I was very confusing looking colored woman. And, 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 and it was, you know, it, it, it struck me that uh, being asked a question like that, I could have responded in a very angry manner. But then, you know, the late Mr. Patel said, uh, and I chose to, to go the educational route. And that's why I'm asking this question to Drikas, because we, you know, in the space and we're still experiencing this. So the history that you might not have known, the history that you experience through reading, through engagement with Romano. How do we take this forward? How, how do we make this work for uplifting rugby in our country even further? Thank you, Long. Good evening, everyone. Um, before I start answering the question, I just want to say it really is an honor to sit here um, with a lot of legends and a lot of people that made a difference in my life. Um, you, you mentioned that I played with Thunder, but when I was 19 years old and came to Western Province, Kasim it I mean, okay, it was the first of the academy to some of the many. Uh, Peter Uesta was there, Ken for Daniel by Lark. So there's a lot of guys here that made a lot of make made a big difference in my life also. So it's that's really is an honor to sit here. Um, I want to start off my answer by answering your question about diversity and inclusivity. And um, I think it started for me already at school. I grew up in Utene. So I actually got lots of battle under Toby. In Utenek, in Utenek, the it was it was very much more equal because it is an industrial town. So the so fun, financially, um, the races were, were much more equal than in other towns. And when I was in standard nine, my school decided that they wanted to become stronger in rugby. Um, and the first guy that went to go search for was Sean Plaikis. <laughs> Sean Plaikis was the captain of SS schools, the first yeah. black captain of SS schools. Um, I can still remember the first day that uh, Sean arrived at school. Um, it was actually my father knew him before he came to school. Um, he stayed with us a few days before he came to school and the first day when he came there, he sat by the tennis courts on his own. <laughs> Shame. And I went to him and said, Sean, what are you doing? He said, well, I don't know where to go. And I said, well, come with me. And uh, because he was a fantastic rugby player and everybody knew about him, it was very easy for him to, to integrate. Um, but that team of ours was very multiracial. And already there I could see the advantage of, of diversity. And that was just on the rugby field. The difference in style that Sean brought, the difference in style that Wayne van Dierden brought, the difference in style that the Wally Iman board brought that we, we diversity in a rugby sense made a massive difference. Then from here I went to France and in France I saw it even more. So my first team that I played for um, at Montpellier, I played for Montpellier was 
also bless from that breed on its own. <laughs> I'm from obviously French, South Africans, New Zealanders, Australians, so it was very diverse. And I saw the power of that diversity, what it can bring, not only then on the rugby field, but also on deciding where we want to go. So then diversity came into decision making, which uh, where I saw the advantage of that. I think Elon now going to that we should start in our own in, our, in your own house. For us as an educational organization and being at Stellenbosch, we start here and we start making a difference here. Um, I must say that, that Elon is, is, is very strong in pushing us towards not we don't want to call it community upliftment, we call it community building. We build community around Stellenbosch and we include the word inclusivity or community clubs. Yeah. So we start here um, and I believe that is the, that is the future. And I believe that what Romana said and what Toby said, everybody said, what we always say, what we went through will, will, will take us forward. Not only there's different histories that I think we can all we can all learn from Kabamba first that grew up in Oaksworth. There's new histories now that, that I think can take us forward, can, can take us as, as young administrators forward also. Um, I've, I've, I've recently gotten to know Dimitri, and I think the way forward for us is also to take hands for me with a guy like Dimitri. I mean, we've, we've got different resources and different, um, but we put in place the same processes, we've got in place the same thought patterns. We, we have to make the same decisions. So I think the, the days of looking at different resources is maybe not the way to go anymore. Look at the, look at the guys that have to put in place the same resources or, or the same processes, sorry. Make the same decisions. Um, now, you know, I'm, I'm very excited for the future. I think that um, I think there's a lot of things we can learn from the past and we do stand on the shoulders of giants like the one who said. Um, but, but I do feel that our generation now can, can, can really make a difference and take it further. Um, with the respect that we have for everything that was done. So it's, um, so, Tando, you've, you've experienced it all. Um, you know, the, the debates around the Springbok logo, you know, you've, you've been there. You've represented the team. Um, the discussions of whether adequate resources are being invested into rugby. And since we returned to international rugby, so many things have happened. Um, and then I kind of think about it. You guys are still, you and Trickers, you're still young, eh? Just <laughs> um, saying. But, you know, you, 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 you tell your story, you decided to write a book, and I remember you and I passionately hope, uh, speak about telling a story, and, and you decided to do that. Um, you know, you now, you focus on women's rugby, you're passionate about it. You, you are a, an administrator to administrator, from a leader, from telling stories, writing books. I mean, you're going towards uh, uh, Dr. Hendricks now, becoming an academic. All, all of this, you know, we, we, you know, the fact that we just decided a la vite what owns Vietnam, you know, that's what we told them. Everything, you, you've been there, you've done that, you've experienced it, you continue to, to experience. What are the lessons from all of that that you believe we as South Africans that love this game can, can, can journey with so that we can continue to advance the game of rugby? And thank you, thank you, Ilam. I think first and foremost, um, thanks for the welcome. I think um, it was an invite I couldn't say no to uh, when Mark phoned me and um, in fact he instructed me, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I had no choice. Uh, I could have found an excuse, uh, but I, like you've said, I think <laughs> I've got so many scars but I hide my scars because I think what is important is I'm on the right path. And I think if I look at Jesus, I make an analogy of him carrying the cross and he, them putting that crown, so many thorns, the one goal was still to go and die for his people. I'm not a biblical person, but I just talk in terms of me. I mean, when I met Sas Bailey, I met him on the fifth floor 
at the SARO offices then, little did I know that I'd meet so many people in that building. We were identified in the SporNet Excellence Program, which was one of the best programs to unearth the black talent at the stage. It's not yet recognized or it's never been given the recognition, but I'm firmly of the belief without the SporNet Excellence, we would not have seen so many players come to the fore and try and push their pride or their, <coughs> you know, their talent up to the world stage. I was fortunate enough to learn the game and play the game with, with all the nationalities in the country. So I've, I've seen it all, but firmly once again, I also learned that talent is not enough. You've got to constantly work on yourself and also mental strength. Rugby requires you to be a harder, in Afrikaans they put it, a harder man, <laughs> because it's not for the faint-hearted. It's never for the faint-hearted. So if you depend on talent, you don't have the heart, you'll be exposed immediately, because it requires you to have a heart. Also, when I wrote my story, I was very motivated by one person who said, what story do I have to tell? And that's someone asking a question without even taking your footprints to I've played and I've done so many things. I've never done right things. But what I've done right is I've always followed the passion that rugby can and still be an inclusive sport for everyone. And I'm saying this, if you look back, South African rugby was very strong when they had development programs where we sort of lost the plot was when those development programs were all put aside because there was an in-look of just merit <coughs> If you look at merit programs, you look at only specifically Craven Week. There was no Academy Weeks. There was no other developmental weeks. We are one of the richest, we are one of the richest <coughs> countries when it comes to talent. Two days ago, I witnessed an SA under 20 training in Pretoria. I watched and I said to myself, if only we can trust the processes of gaining, putting money into development of rugby. What can you do in one week that is sufficient to cover you for the rest of the week? Nothing. Constantly have <clears throat> tournaments constantly have these identifying <coughs> projects. So therefore I'm saying, for us to be the best, we've got to go back to what worked best and what worked everything in place from primary right up to seniors. And I think also, emotionally train our players. We never had an, I never had an opportunity to see a psychologist to toughen me up. I had to do that myself. But a lot of people go through <coughs> so much. And mentally, you find guys, if you mention rugby, they go crazy. They've distanced themselves for the game that they love in silence. <coughs> but therefore, if you want more administrators, more referees, more <coughs> administrators, who can lead a certain province? Because if Everyone who's asked that responsibility just looks at the amount of daggers that will lie in wait for him to fail in that position. So therefore, one is to understand that the people that are spoken of and the person that I admired and I worked with was Judge Lexham Party. Despite me and him working on a internal investigation, I would find time and talk about his I don't see myself out of rugby. People try to get me out of the game, but I found my way in the game. Because it's just quite a big a scope for you not to be part of. That's if you want to be part of. So once again, I think I don't want to be long, but I'm saying, and I agree with, with our guest speaker, unity was for a reason. Now we ask ourselves the question, what happened to that template? 
The template is gone. Now we depend on caucuses, which are not unity, which people use for themselves to escalate themselves to other positions. But the main thing is, you've got to have unity to know that for myself, I've got to do the hours. There is no pilot that can run or fly a Boeing A380, none, from a flying school. There's no one. They will ask you how many hours you've acquired over a certain period that you've been a so-called pilot. If you don't have the hours, you then don't drive, you don't then fly a, 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 a link a plane. You then have to move to a 702 before you get onto the international setup. Rugby is missing that. It's missing for me what I can get from a Toby Titus. Or who has been, uh, I always say this, you have to have a prodigy. How many prodigies? It speaks fondly of yourself and the gentleman is just mentioned. But who else is there in that line that has been his prodigies? We need people that have mentored us so that we, when we take over the baton, we are also already trained to come up with our own prodigies. Mm -hmm. So that for me is important, is the essence of the puzzle is there. <coughs> Build around what? Build around winning. How do you get a winning culture? Winning culture, you have to have a proper pathway into making sure everything succeeds and not only the golden goose, which we are celebrating now. And if something fails with the golden goose, you can't blame, then you start blaming whatever comes through to get to the golden goose. We've got to be South African rugby and rugby lovers. We've got to unite from the smaller ones right through, but we teach them, same as the schools, we teach them where our rugby comes from and where it is going and why we need to give opportunities to the less privileged. That's why we've got to also make sure that we also identify and have this program so that when we leave, because we've got to give also our, I've also got to leave the bulls at some point or the other. But I know when I leave the bulls, I've set a proper structured women's program that wasn't there. And I'm proud of, but therefore it must go on for years going forward. So I'm thanking everyone who's here that has played an, in, an internal part in my life uh, of where I am and where I continue and want to be in the rugby sphere. But let us not forget that it is also important that we help each other up. And I'm happy that Trikas is offering his hand to the gentleman who's our MC. That because you, you don't see that. What you see, you see a lot of infighting amongst us. And that sort of delays and derails make sure that we unify as best for a very long time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Think about the race, okay, I think we can project our voices. Um, I'm going to come to Mr. Kassim. So you've heard the stories, you've listened to, you know, you watched the video, the appreciation from Trickers, and I'm sure so others. Um, give us, give us, give us, let us leave here tonight, whatever, give us hope, um, because you, you have a lot of wisdom. Um, there is no need to still give you a the easel. Um, I think the people in charge of the rugby is doing a wonderful job. The only thing that I expect and want to ask the people here, our youngsters growing up do not want to play rugby anymore. The reason being is there is no future for them in the game because they are not being recognized as sports people or as rugby people when they are attending schools that is not involved in rugby. They have to go to clubs in our unions to go play junior rugby and nobody looks at them reads about them or talks about them, the only thing that happens is the few people that look after them is there always for them. So I'm asking some, and this is a serious thing because our rugby is dying in the townships. 
So I'm asking you to make sure for the sake of the Brian's help, let us get our youngsters back into the game. Thank you. <laughs> you've seen it, you've experienced it. Um, we had the honor to do this tonight um, and, and we want to thank you for it. But what is it that you'd like to tell us? Just, you know, something that, 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 that we can, that can say with us um, as a departing note to say, let's continue to remember. You, it's a very special thing that my father-in-law mentioned was that we must continue in the transit that he set for all of us to make it a success and to make sure that our feeding schemes from out of our schools and our juniors are equipped so that we can follow through an even bigger success. Our success starts at a very junior level and our feeding schemes I suppose that is the most important I think it is part of our And for that important thing, for my father in law, to make sure that he has spent his time, okay, and his life is given up to the sport. Yeah. His family has gone through quite a lot, mm -hmm. making sure that he can offer his best at all times. And that we are grateful for. So we really should try and focus on the junior side of sport. Mark, you know, you spoke very fondly about being given an opportunity to lead. And Mr. Patel saying to you, even though you said you wanted to play, he said you are ready for that leadership chief. One lesson that will remain of you about the relationship that you had with him. There's one thing you always said to me, you know, in life you make your you make your own luck in life. It says what you put into something will get out. If you put ten percent in, you get ten percent out. They're successful in their own lives. You know, Mr. Patel was just one other the team. You know, Mr. Patel used to teach all the kids in the area mm -hmm. who struggled nights, used to go to him to his house to start to, to, to learn that. So he's, he's been a guiding light also. You never get hot on the collar when you're under pressure. You sit there, you take it in, and you speak, and your mind is right. Not when you're angry. So, and he was, a, he was a very eloquent person. He spoke at various forums. I won't forget the day we received our ground ball blazers at um, Ellis Park. He put things in perspective uh, where we come from, and where we're going to. And they gave us uh, 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 inferior jackets. And I mean inferior jackets, it's those uh, nylon jackets. Mm -hmm. And he said, guys, as you walk past, you're not accepting throws in this box. And he said, the part of us threw in that box because it, it's those small things. It's those small things. When you recognize something, you recognize it fully or you don't recognize it at all. And he was he was just he was just an unbelievable leader, you know. He, he, he led from principal point of view. He could teach you about religion. I'm a Christian, he could tell me about religion. And he, and, and he, was, he, was, he was just an unbelievable person when it comes to leadership, you know. He mentored us when we went wrong. As players, he used to come and tell us, you know, your life. You know, you used to be on the right path. I was a very naughty fellow. Uh, <laughs> and that's why I came to uh, uh, The year before I became his deputy, I was suspended for 12 weeks, and part of my suspension was being the recording secretary. And in those 12 weeks, he, he took me on his wing and he, he taught me a lot of life lessons, and I'll never forget those. So thank you. Masha, I know you, you're up now. Um, what you take from tonight, is, is very important, I'm sure, for a lot of us. And I know you're going to uh, you know, say a few words. Um, but listening to everybody here, um, you know, telling the stories, um, whilst not mentioning his name, we know, we know that he had a role to play. 
and it were to recontextualize the history of rugby. You know, and, and it's not about whether you know it's a research idea or what. Recon recontextualize rugby. Much for hosting us here this evening. Um, it's a bit of a difficult question for me to answer, but I would say that. Um, um, my dad getting up till two, three in the mornings to write on a photograph all the exact board's names the way he wanted it. Um, that's the type of person he was. And then also, um, I think he was very, very um, passionate about our people that mustn't forget their roots, where they came from. It's very strong points that we mustn't forget where we came from and how we struggle to get where we are today. Um, I remember the days when I had to go and fetch Mr. Steve Churchill and he just came out of prison every night or every Thursday night in Lumero so that he can spend time with my dad and he was very very passionate about where we are into as a country and then uh, also today uh, it's sad to say that a lot of our people has lost focus of that and um, for us to just to get back onto the route and where we came from and then that is the most important thing for him. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to give each one of you literally 30 seconds. 30 seconds yeah, to make a closing remark. Mr. T, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm speaking on behalf of everybody here present. I think on behalf of all of us, I thank you. A new chapter has been opened tonight in regard to non-racialism in sport. It's one of the most neglected topics. I always tell my mates, we stir the stars behind bars and that we've got to explore. It, the history of rugby is not complete until every, even if they were uh, uh, on the other side, after we have a complete picture and people can decide on their own. And to the Patel family I want to say, some people leave bumps in the sand. Some people leave memories in the sand and sacrifices in the sand that can be worthy to follow if they know more there. Thanks. Do I have to follow that? <laughs> I think from my side, um, just listen and learn. I think it was a fantastic opportunity for, for me personally and I think for everybody in the room just to listen and learn and there were so many lessons. I mean, for Ibrahim Patel to go through tough times like he did and bullying times that, that he did um, and for where we are now, I think you said your dad was principle based. I think his principles must have been very strong. I think to, to not budge um, and keep on believing in what he wanted to do, his principles not only, it wasn't only principle based, it had to be very strong. Um, and yeah, I think for me, listen and learn and, and then we can take it forward. I'd just like to thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, I've learned a considerable deal and it's been a most inspiring occasion. Thank you. Mine will be just on the 18th of March. Uh, there will be a 32 year celebration since Unity, which happened in Kimba in 1992. Oh, yeah. And I think such lessons we need to celebrate and look back and see how far we've come, but also to make sure that we shorten and have nice periodic achievements that we set ourselves post that, so that we don't have to look that far, far back to, to realize our own achievements in the rugby sphere. So I think just based on that is that let's continue to applaud the achievements, but work on those less achieved uh, targets that we had or set ourselves as sports administrators. Thank you. Uh, Ilam, the organizers, thank you. 
also for the family that I had the opportunity um, to be the first uh, person to give an input in what I hope would be a sustainable project. So I have, I have two calls. My first call is to Stellenbosch University as a research institution. How will you make sure that we institutionalize and make serious business of documenting the history of non-racial sport, not in a fragmented way, but in a sustainable uh, and accountable manner? And with that, my call is to the South African Rugby Union, uh, Mr. Mark Alexander, Saru, uh, Western Province, and all the other provinces. Don't let history judge you that on your watch, our history became sand. You and us are the last generation in whose living memory these events has taken place. Let history not judge us that we have failed to secure our history and heritage and tell the world. Thank you. Meneer vertel het in een van zijn laatste toespraken het ek gesê when I meet my mother she won't ask me about rugby. She will ask me about my faith about my religion. Hy het vir my gesê hoe geloof vast sy ma was en hy principles wat sy in hom en was haar koppig. En my vrou sê altyd vir my, my prachtige vrou wat van hand en gehoor sê, sê sê altyd vir my Romano. Apologies, program director. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Hopefully next time I shall say gentlemen and Ladies, um, you are welcome to take the seat uh, before I hand over to You must help me now. Thank you very much for joining the panel. Over to you. I'm surprised that you remember that. Thank you, Diam. I distinctly remember that. Thank you. Okay, very well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and panelists. That was a very interesting event. I think we all have done it. We are the only one who is from the Memorial Lecture. And I think, before we leave this place, we will give you a chance to do with us a word of thanks. En misschien, ik ga niet weer alleen te krijgen om te praten. Ik wil van allemaal iets nooit wat nog morgen die kaart ergens is. Fatih kan het niet terug. Anna gaat boot toe. Hoosan Park, Kabamba. Hoe zit u? Ik ga er zes mee niet. Dat is het die zang gevier. Dat is net straks de hand. Ik ga nu hier over te laten gaan. Ik ga nu over te laten gaan. Mr. Jacobs, Mr. Alexander, Dr. Snyder, the esteemed members of the panel and the audience. I'm here today on behalf of my family to express a profound and heartfelt gratitude to all those who made this event possible. An event that honors our dad, Ibrahim Patel, as a legend he is. We are proud of his legacy, one that was achieved by hard work dedication and sacrifice. But legacies are not built in a vacuum. Tonight, we acknowledge that he, that he was surrounded by men who share those attributes. To his esteemed board, Mr. Titus, Mr. Kununu, acknowledge your role in the building of that legacy. It would be remiss for me not to include our mother, Mrs. Diana Patel, there's a right pronunciation, Diana. <laughs> Our unwavering support enabled our dad to dedicate himself to the pursuit of freedom and justice for all through non-racial sports. I would like to start to thank Mr. Romano Lakeri for his initiative and hard work in making this event possible. Thank you, Romano. 
We want to express our sincere thanks to the State of Bosch University for hosting this auspicious event. To the Director of Program, Mr. Jacob, for your leadership. Mr. Alexander Mark, thank you very much for your welcome remarks. Dr. Snyder, thank you for such informative lecture. To the panel for leading a great discussion. To the following rugby institutions, SEFCO United Rugby, Borland Rugby, Western Marty's Rugby, and South African Rugby. To Global Sports Network, formally we appreciate your efforts in recording an oral history of rugby. It is such an important component in preserving history. The decision to name the trophy the Brand of Your Cup will be a tangible way to cement this contribution to the sport he not only loved but used as a vehicle through which he advocated the freedom and justice. A trophy by nature is passed from one champion to another. There is no greater way to honor his legacy than by ensuring that his love for rugby and the fight for justice and equality is passed on. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for making the time to be here. I trust that we all see each other at the championship match tomorrow. Thank you, Donkey. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the